Thank you all uh, very much for coming. My name is John Hamry. I'm the president at CSIS, and I am only here in an ornamental role to say thank you to you and to get out of the way as quickly as possible so that you all have a chance to, of course, hear uh, State Secretary Matai. We are, uh, we're grateful that he has given us this opportunity, uh, that he's using CSIS as uh, a platform to address the policy community in Washington. Uh, the State Secretary is uh, one of the most senior and skilled uh, members of the, of the Foreign Service in India and has an exceptionally distinguished career and track record. I'm going to let uh, Rick Indeferth uh, be the one to formally introduce him. We're fortunate at CSS that in the last year to have created an India program and Ambassador Indeferth is the first shareholder, the Wadwani chairholder, and we're very grateful that we have this opportunity to bring such a very senior man to Washington and to have him share his policy insights and perspectives. I'm hearing some noise over here. Whatever this is, could we turn it off, whatever it is? It's overhead. Okay, we'll figure out what that is. That's the last thing uh, <laughs> that we need to have interrupting things here. Uh, you know, I th I'm the only infant in this place, so I think we need to get on with things. So, Rick, let me ask you to come and formally get the program started. Thank you all. I would ask that you respect uh, the, the, uh, the Foreign Secretary. His formal remarks are going to be on the record, but his response to questions and answers are going to be off the record, and I'd ask you all to respect that, please. Okay, Rick, please, why don't you get us started? Well, I'm glad the, um, the background noise has been discovered. Uh, I was about to say it sounded like Congress, but I shouldn't have thought that. Uh, and I hope that former Congressman Ambassador Tim Romer will excuse that expression. Welcome. Uh, good to see you here in Washington. Um, distinguished career. Uh, most recently, our ambassador to New Delhi. So it's great to have you here. Uh, Foreign Secretary, it's Delightful to have you here, if I'm not mistaken, and Ambassador Arun Singh um, made it clear to me that this was a great occasion because I think this is your first visit to Washington as Foreign Secretary. Is that correct? And we're delighted that CSIS is the first port of entry in the think tank world uh, for the Foreign Secretary to speak to an audience here about U.S.-Indian relations. Um, John, thank you very much for the welcoming. I'd like to say just a very f few words about uh, the Foreign Secretary and his background and then hear from him and then we'll have a Q&A session. We have one hour and as uh, John Hamry said, we'll leave the first part will be on the record, his remarks, and then we'll have an off the record session, uh, many topics to discuss. So first of all, on your first visit here as Foreign Secretary, he um, took this position in August, uh, replacing the uh, now ambassador to the United States from India, uh, Ambassador Rao. So we're delighted to have um, him here uh, and delighted to have her here. Uh, two wonderful uh, appointments of the Indian government. Uh, ambassador Mathai has spent his career in the Foreign Service, uh, joining in 1974. Earlier in his career, you spent some time in Washington, if that's Correct, so this is not his first time to the Washington world uh, and delighted to have you back in this capacity. He has had several uh, ambassadorial appointments, including to Israel, Qatar, Deputy High Commissioner to the United Kingdom, and most recently, Ambassador to France. So India has sent once again one of their most distinguished and experienced Foreign Service personnel to Washington, and uh, we're delighted to welcome you here. So, Foreign Secretary, if you'd like to take the podium, and we look forward to your remarks. Dr. John Hamry, Ambassador Indifferth, Ambassador Roma, other distinguished diplomats, members of the think tank community, uh, friends. Thank you, uh, Dr. Hamre and uh, Ambassador Indifferth for your kind words of introduction and for setting the stage so eloquently for a discussion on Indo India-US relations. 
Uh, I, I believe it's an honor and privilege for me to be hosted at the Statesman's Forum at the Center for Strategic and International Studies, a center of great eminence and scholarship, and one that now has a special link to India through the Wadwani Chair for India-US Policy Studies. I'm fairly sure that I'm here purely as a guest, as I am no statesman, particularly not in uh, President Truman's definition of that, which was a statesman is a politician who's been dead for about 10 or 15 years. <laughs> but I am returning to Washington uh, more than 25 years after I did a three-year tour of duty at our embassy here. And besides the iconic architectural marvels of the city, and the reassuringly familiar feel of Embassy Row, much has indeed changed in this city. As someone said, K Street is certainly a lot more prosperous. <laughs> and yet, uh, much remains entirely the same, and that I think is particularly true of the vigor of your debates and the fact that they encompass the entire globe. While change is a constant companion of time, it is also true that since the mid 80s, the world has seen more profound political, economic, technological, and strategic changes than we would normally expect in a period of two or three decades. Yet, through these changes, the significance of the United States to the whole world has not altered. But India's ongoing transformation and the new India-US relationship are both part of what has changed, and both can have a considerable impact on the shape of the world in the 21st century. When I returned to Delhi last July to prepare for my current assignment, I had the good fortune to begin with the second India-US strategic dialogue, which Ambassador Nirupama Rao, as you pointed out, who was then our foreign secretary, was coordinating so ably. I was struck by the depth and the diversity of our partnership, the comfort and candor in our dialogue, and the extensive support it enjoyed across a broad spectrum of public opinion, particularly among those looking to the future. Some of us are absorbed with the present, which is of course a bridge to the future, but it became evident to me that what was perhaps unprecedented and novel in our relationship even just 10 years ago is even right now part of the normal and the routine. There are many here who have experienced or participated in that change, and few would understand it as well as Ambassador Inderfurth, who was handling this account at critical times. We spent the first decade of this century in building this relationship, addressing the constraints of the past and laying the foundation for the future. It was an ambitious enterprise that required great political investment in both countries. And even as our relationship has matured, it continues to be infused with dynamism and momentum. In the years since President Obama's visit to India in November 2010, we have sustained an unprecedented level of bilateral engagement launched new strategic consultations that cover key regions of the world, began our first trilateral consultation, which includes Japan, advanced our cooperation on non-proliferation and nuclear security, deepened counterterrorism and intelligence cooperation, launched a new homeland security dialogue, made steady progress in our partnership on export controls and nuclear security, concluded the largest defense deal yet in our bilateral relations, sustained military exercises and broadened defense strategic dialogue, taken forward the incipient cooperation for development in third countries, especially Africa, held a very successful higher education summit in Washington, D.C., and made innovation-driven progress in areas such as clean energy, food security, and healthcare. We resumed negotiations on a bilateral investment treaty and expanded opportunities for economic cooperation through measures like the Infrastructure Debt Fund and tariff reductions on products with potential for bilateral trade. Indeed, I do not think that we have had as much convergence or spoken more transparently and extensively with each other as we do now on some of the most important issues in our engagement, terrorism, and key regional issues including Afghanistan, Myanmar, and the future of the Asia Pacific. These developments would constitute a remarkable year in any bilateral relationship. Yet there are in both countries questions about the state and direction of our relationship. Some of this, as we all realize, comes from the fact that the relationship no longer derives its intensity and excitement from the pursuit of one transformational idea. And it has matured into a solid, broad-based relationship. There are, of course, tangible issues. 
in the US, there are worries about the commercial implementation of the civil nuclear agreement and lingering disappointment with one major defense contract. In India, there is wariness that the relationship may be turning transactional with an emphasis on immediate returns than on the upward trends. There is anxiety about protectionist trends in the US, especially in our IT industry, that has been the bridge between our two economies so far. And in both countries, developments in West Asia have raised questions whether our approaches, if not our interests, are consistent, at least in the immediate future. It is important to address these issues. As our Prime Minister, Dr. Manmohan Singh, has said, the India-US Civil Nuclear Initiative is a symbol, instrument, and a platform of a transformed India-US relationship. We are committed to translating the success of our diplomatic partnership in changing the global nuclear order into an equally productive commercial cooperation in civil nuclear energy. We have the reality of our law passed by our parliament. And as we have said before, we will provide a level playing field to US companies and are prepared to address specific concerns of US companies within the framework of that law. We have remained engaged and must now take practical steps to advance our cooperation as we have done over the past year. We have just had a round of discussions between the legal experts on the implications of our law. The commencement of discussions between the Indian operator, which is the Nuclear Power Corporation of India, and the US companies in regard to what they call an early works agreement is an encouraging development. Our defense procurement in India has to be based on the best techno-economic choice in accordance with procurement guidelines, and it must also meet the test of parliamentary scrutiny on procurement process, an obligation I believe is not unfamiliar to you in Washington, D.C. It also bears repeating that our defense trade has gone from negligible levels a few years ago to a cumulative value of about $9 billion in the last four or five years and is set to expand further. On both sides, we are making continuous progress in understanding each other's procurement and approval process, extending our engagement from simple trade to technology transfer and joint research, development, and production. Our dialogues on regional issues have been expanding. Let me start with the developments in West Asia in 2011, which may have taken us all by surprise. In our discussions, we are all trying to comprehend the underlying causes and the forces involved and striving to grasp the consequences and, the sense, and sense the outcomes of changes that have generated both hope and concerns in a region of global significance. Six million Indians live in that region. They constitute the largest expatriate group there, and obviously their welfare is a matter of high priority for us. The region is critical for our economy, contributing over $100 billion by way of export markets, over $40 billion annually in remittances, and more than two-thirds of our petroleum imports. This in a country which is dependent on imports for 75% of its total oil consumption. Peace and stability and a climate of moderation in the region are absolutely vital for us. We not only have strong political and economic ties with the countries in the region, but also enjoy a warm relationship with their people. Since before the time when India became one of the earliest destinations for the three great religions from West Asia, India and the West Asian countries have shared close and natural ties as neighbors. Ties of religion continue to bind us. India has always had and will remain sensitive to the interests, aspirations, and the rights of people in West Asia. And we do expect that their governments too will respect their rights and respond to their aspirations. However, we look at the developments there, we are all united by the desire for peace and stability in the region, and we must seek to forge the broadest possible consensus on our collective response. It also follows from our stakes in the region that we do not wish to see the spread of nuclear weapons in West Asia. India's position on the question of Iran's nuclear program is well known, and our votes in the IAEA speak for themselves. We believe that while Iran has the rights to peaceful uses of nuclear energy, it must also fulfill its international obligations as a non-nuclear weapon state under the NPT. We would like to see the issue resolved peacefully through negotiations. We also hope that negotiations between the P5 plus one, as it is called, and Iran would resume soon and contribute to a positive outcome. 
Iran is our near neighbor. It is our only surface access to Central Asia and Afghanistan and constitutes a declining but still significant share of our oil imports, currently just below 10%. For us, there are also broader and long-term geostrategic concerns that are no different from what we face elsewhere in the Asia-Pacific region. Our relationship with Iran is neither inconsistent with our non-proliferation objectives, nor is it in contradiction with the relationships that we have with our friends in West Asia or with the United States and Europe. These are important even if difficult issues, and one of the heartening aspects of the India-US relationship has been that we are able to discuss them respectfully and candidly with a sense of appreciation of each other's perspectives and a recognition, I believe, that while the choices that each makes may have a bearing on the other, they are certainly not directed against each other. Beyond that, we continue to be guided by a larger vision for our strategic partnership and the value of all that our two sides have built together. In India, we are confident that the long-term framework of our partnership will continue to become stronger and more broad-based. Let me highlight the priorities. India and the United States can and must strengthen their economic partnership. The flow of trade in goods and services and investments in both directions has grown several times in the past two decades. Today we have around 40 billion of US imports, both goods and services. Indian businesses have invested perhaps $26 billion in the US in five years. All this has created new job openings in the US. It is also natural that as the Indian economy continues to grow and modernize, as the U US economy recovers its momentum, and as the global economic situation improves, our trade and investment relations will surge to higher levels. India's planned infrastructure spending of about $1 trillion in the next five years, the modernization of our agriculture sector, our shift to clean energy, the implementation of the civil nuclear agreement, the burgeoning defense trade, cooperation in higher education, and the growing ability of the Indian companies to compete in the US market could take our economic ties to an entirely new level. We remain committed to pursuing economic reforms in India in their broadest sense. The debate in India today is not a question about economic growth, efficiency, and openness, much as we value all these, but it is about equity, empowerment, and opportunities for a large section of the population which feels they were left behind during the country's two decades of rapid economic growth. We are, of course, affected by the international debate on globalization and its discontents. We do hope the current economic challenges in the US would not lead to protectionism and that the concerns of Indian IT industry will be addressed quickly. NASCOM, the body which represents our IT industry, estimates that the Indian industry employs over 100,000 in the US, up from 20,000 six years ago. It supports 200,000 other jobs including indirect ones, apart from enhancing the competitiveness of some US industries. Most Indian companies are setting up development centers here. The Indian IT industry has contributed $15 billion in taxes over the last five years. This success story could not, should not be set back by stringent visa regulations which act as a non-tariff barrier. According to a back of the envelope calculation, which was done in my office by a representative, uh, of NASCOM, Indians have paid over $200 million in visa fees. Somewhere between 30 to 50 million has been taken from young aspiring Indians working in business whose US visas were rejected. Veritably, the pink slip has become a greenback. It needs reiteration that the targets of these discriminatory actions are precisely those who have contributed to an contributed intellectually to the climate of reform in India and who have been votaries of strong India-US relationships. As our economic ties deepen, we will obviously have a growing range of policy and regulatory concerns with each other. But we have in place an elaborate system of bilateral mechanisms to address them. While we should expeditiously conclude a bilateral investment treaty, we must look beyond it too. The United States, strangely, is the only advanced economy in the world with which India has not concluded or is not pursuing a comprehensive economic partnership agreement. So we should not only focus on expanding trade and investment, but also use the power of innovation to make our economies global leaders in the 21st century. 
and at the same time address the needs of the poorest sections of the population in the world and find solutions to the challenges of clean energy, food security, health, and education. It is gratifying that we have powerful examples of innovative Indo-US partnerships, often forged by the youth of our two countries. Initiatives like the SNT Forum, the SNT Endowment Fund, the Joint Clean Energy Research Center, and the Singh Obama Knowledge Initiative, the Nehru Fulbright Program, are all collaborative ventures of great importance. The enthusiastic response in both countries to these mechanisms demonstrates the enormous potential for collaboration between our two countries. <clears throat> Energy security is of such vital and econ economic and strategic significance for us that we must treat it as a priority in itself. We have a number of financial, technological, and exploratory initiatives with the US in clean and renewable energy, as well as energy conservation and efficiency. And as part of our wide-ranging official um, energy dialogue, we also plan to, di uh, to expand the dialogue to share experiences and perspectives on low carbon growth. I believe that we also need to build on the potential for increasing natural gas product production in India. This energy source could be a significant bridge to a future based on clean energy. And in the transition period, we have to balance our requirements for massive industrial, infrastructural, and transport growth without expanding our carbon footprint excessively. We must also extend the benefit of our cooperation to other countries, building on our incipient cooperation on food security in Africa, or the open government platform that we are developing jointly for application in other interested countries. We must do this not merely as a moral imperative of making economic development more broad-based and inclusive globally, but also for the strategic reason of promoting stability and security in vulnerable parts of the world and to underline the strength of the shared democratic and liberal values. Our partnership is important for building a stable, prosperous, and secure Asia-Pacific region, or as some here have begun to call it, the Indo-Pacific region. This is a region of unprecedented transitions and unsettled questions. But what is clear to most of us is that many of the greatest opportunities, as well as challenges, of the 21st century lie in this region. Our engagements with Southeast Asia and East Asia, and increasingly the Pacific, has expanded over the past two decades. It is an engagement characterized by strong bilateral ties extending from Myanmar to Australia, deepening linkages with regional organizations, especially ASEAN, a web of comprehensive economic partnership agreements and ambitious plans of surface and air connectivity. While our Look East policy began with a strong economic emphasis and content, we now have growing strategic and security engagement in the region. China is our largest neighbor, a major country in the Asia-Pacific region, and a country with great global influence. We have considerable challenges in our relationship, but also enormous opportunities for mutually beneficial partnership at the bilateral and global levels. We will continue to invest in building a stable and cooperative relationship with China that is mutually beneficial and also a source of regional stability and prosperity. There are a number of global and regional challenges on which India, China, and the United States must work together. We welcome the proposal Secretary Clinton made last, in July, made last July in Delhi for a trilateral dialogue between India, China, and the United States. <clears throat> the Indian Ocean is central to India's economy and its security, and it is also a region of growing, uh, growing global strategic attention. India does not want to see this ocean emerge as a contested common or remain vulnerable to natural disasters, piracy, or instability in coastal or littoral states. For this reason, we not only have robust bilateral economic and security relationships in the region, but through regional initiatives we have taken, like the Indian Ocean Naval Symposium and the Indian IORARC, we are seeking to promote comprehensive economic cooperation among the countries of the littoral. Maritime security, more broadly, has emerged as a key national security priority. We believe that this much-hackneyed phrase requires, first and foremost, a collective affirmation of the principles of freedom of navigation, unimpeded commerce, and peaceful settlement of maritime disputes in accordance with international law. This must be an important priority for regional, diplomatic, and political efforts 
and it is an area of growing importance in the India-US relationship. The future of Afghanistan and of Pakistan will continue to engage our two countries. Their future is inseparable from the destiny of India and our region, and therefore India has a vital stake in their stability and progress. With Pakistan, we will continue our endeavor to seek a peaceful, cooperative, and normal relationship. Over the past year, India and the US have had close consultation and coordination on our shared vision of a stable, democratic, and prosperous Afghanistan. It is a vision that can ultimately only be realized by the people of Afghanistan, but they need the support, assistance, facilitation, and sustained commitment of the international community. The quest for a settlement in Afghanistan must ensure that the enormous sacrifices and the efforts of the past decade are not in vain. It must build on progress and change that Afghanistan has experienced in the last 10 years. And it must embrace all sections of Afghan society, including its women and minorities. Any landlocked country's fortunes are linked with its neighbors. In the case of Afghanistan, it is even more so. So we believe that Afghanistan's regional economic integration, whether we call it the new Silk Road Initiative, as Secretary Clinton described it, or as our Ambassador Rao once called it, the Grand, Truck, Grand Trunk Road Initiative, or by any other name, it is important for Afghanistan's and the wider region's stability and prosperity. India's commitment to Afghanistan is reflected in our strategic partnership agreement of October 2011 our $2 billion of assistance, our support for building Afghan capacity for governance, security, and development, Afghanistan's preferential access to the Indian market, and our efforts to improve its connectivity to the world, our commitment to invest in Afghanistan's mining sector, and our willingness to use regional cooperation frameworks with the other neighbors of Afghanistan, including Pakistan and Iran. We should also explore avenues for collaboration between India and the US with others such as Japan for Afghanistan's development, including through the development of its natural resources. Terrorism remains a major security challenge for, the, for India and the US. Our convergence on the source and the nature of the threat emanating from India's neighborhood has never been greater. And our cooperation on combating and protecting our people from terrorism has never been stronger than today. This is a very important aspect of our relationship with a strong public resonance and one that we must continue to strengthen in all its dimensions. We should continue to further strengthen our growing partnership in leading international efforts on non-proliferation, disarmament, and pursuing the goals of the Nuclear Security Summit. India was pleased to host the Sherpas meeting of the Nuclear Security Summit in January. We must also continue to work together to reform and ad adapt the global architecture of governance, security, and non-proliferation to reflect contemporary realities and enable our two countries to work together more effectively for shared interests. Taken together, this is a rich and broad canvas of priorities that also addresses some of the core interests of India and the United States. The question that is often asked is whether our two sides can translate our shared goals into a sustained and effective strategy of engagement and cooperation. It is easy to talk of strategy. One is often reminded of the story of the wise old owl sitting in the jungle and the little mouse who was utterly lost and couldn't find his way out of the jungle. And he comes to the owl and says, oh, wise owl, please tell me, how do I get out of this jungle in which I'm lost? So the owl looks down at him and says, what you should do is grow wings like I have and then rise and fly out of the jungle. <laughs> to which the mouse replies, that's all very well, but how do I grow those wings? And the owl replies, don't bother me with details. I deal only with strategy. <laughs> so, <laughs> so let me then try and look at what are the ways we can try to grow our wings together. India's enduring commitment to strategic autonomy is a reflection of its democratic tradition and a conscious policy given our external environment and our national development goals. But it does not mean that India will not assume its international responsibility, nor is it mutually exclusive to building a strong strategic partnership. Indeed, it is natural that our shared values 
and the wide range of our convergent interests will lead to a deepening partnership of shared endeavors. Given our different circumstances, history, location, and the levels of development, we will occasionally have differing perspectives and policies. But this can be a source of great value and strength in our dialogue. And it, is all, it also enables us to work together for a broad global consensus on issues of common interest. But for that, we should attach real value to each other's perspectives and appreciate each other's interests and sensitivities. And when we differ, we should be able to speak candidly and respectfully to each other and insulate the vast common ground between us from the differences in our relationship. We must remember that while we may have occasionally different perspectives, we are also united by a fundamental stake in each other's success, because in succeeding individually, we can advance our common interests and inspire a world mirrored in our ideals. And even if our two governments did nothing, it would still be an extraordinary relationship because of the growing ties of kinship between our people and the vitality of private partnerships of enterprise, innovation, research, and education across every field of human endeavor. But I believe that we do have the political momentum, the public goodwill, a comprehensive architecture of engagement, comfort and confidence in the relationship, the experience of bold and ambitious undertakings, a proven capacity to work through challenges, and as we have seen in recent years, a growing habit of taking tangible steps on a regular basis to advance our cooperation. So as I look ahead, we will continue to consolidate and affirm our strategic partnership by completing existing projects and focusing on the wealth of new opportunities that we have. We should continue to stay in close touch on the current challenges in the world, in our neighborhood and beyond. And we should above all continue to strengthen and expand the long-term strategic framework of our relationship so that we can fully harness the boundless opportunities that this relationship has for our people and the substantial benefit that it can bring to this world. Thank you. Foreign Secretary, I think you referred to a rich and broad canvas of priorities I think you have sketched out for us in your very comprehensive remarks, a great uh, beginning point for our discussion with questions and answers, because I think that he has given us a very full account of where this U.S.-India relationship has come in a relatively short period of time over the past decade. Uh, and all of the issues that we're now engaged in. This is truly a broad-based relationship uh, from the economic partnership through en energy security to regional issues, uh, including uh, your reference when you said about India's Look East policy beginning in the 1990s. Uh, I'd like to actually start with that point of departure uh, because you mentioned the Look East policy. We have had, if you will, a pivot west policy announced by the uh, Obama administration and Secretary Clinton. Uh, we're now looking to what she referred to in a foreign policy article, the Pacific Century. Uh, Asia is going to be our future and a very important orientation for U.S. foreign policy. Uh, Secretary Clinton came to Chennai and gave a very important speech there uh, after the last strategic partnership meeting, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, I'd like to get your sense on how you see uh, the recommendations being made in Washington for India's greater role, leadership role, looking east, and the intriguing notion of possibly moving toward a trilateral dialogue, trilateral uh, relationship discussion uh, with um, uh, the United States, uh, India, and China. Do you think that that has any uh, near-term prospect? So if we could start on the larger geopolitical uh, discussion, then we'll go to questions and answers. Well, I thank you. I'd like to start by saying that uh, the the pivot, as you you described it, um, is a matter of very great interest to us in India. Uh, our Look East policy, if I may, uh, just um, begin with that, as you correctly said, is now more than a decade old. It started with a focus on economic uh, relationships, economic partnerships and also building on the very strong cultural foundation of uh, the mutualities between India and Southeast Asia. But it was also a, an attempt to build 
a series of relationships, not just with Southeast Asia, but with the entire uh, Pacific region, uh, which we see as a, an important part of India's um, foreign policy outreach. We regard Southeast Asia now as part of the extended neighborhood of India. And we have gone along with the ASEAN uh, definition of how this relationship really must move forward to a, to a, a larger extent than, um, um, than earlier. And as it has gradually moved up from the economic and the commercial to the technical to sharing strategic perspectives and finally now having actual meetings of defense dialogues. So it's a gradual uh, work in progress, but it is intended to anchor India very much in the development of Southeast Asia and the Asia Pacific region. We see that as very much part of our um, natural uh, movement as we grow and expand. As regards the trilateral with China, this is, an, uh, we think it's a very, very good idea. China also has very important interests in the same region. Uh, the United States is already a major player in it. What we have been told is that in response to our uh, enthusiastic response, uh, you might say, is that the Chinese have said for the moment they would like this as a track two dialogue rather than moving straight to an official. Probably they'd like to sound out and see where this is leading the three of us. So that's where it stands at the moment. Um, may we go to questions and answers? And if you could identify yourself and your affiliation. Yes, in the back. Hi, my name is Victoria Sampson. I'm the Washington Office Director for the Secure World Foundation. Uh, Mr. Secretary, thank you for being here today. I do have a question about an opportunity for, for a strategic partnership um, that you did not mention, and that would be with the United States and in, in India to cooperate on space, uh, particularly since the United States has relaxed some of our export control restrictions for some Indian organizations. Um, is this a good opportunity to possibly engage the Chinese even? Be curious to hear your thoughts, thank you. Space. Oh, yes, I think uh, this is potentially one of the areas of uh, uh, cooperation. Um, just to set the record uh, straight, we are indeed already cooperating. NASA and the Indian Space Research Organization do have elements of cooperation. It could be uh, a lot bigger. Uh, there are some issues relating to policy and regulation on both sides, I think, which we will need to overcome. Uh, there's a debate and a dialogue going on. I don't think uh, either of us have thought of including China in this particular one, um, to the best of my knowledge. Uh, there are some issues relating to what you describe, what you call CSLA, the Commercial Space Launch uh, Initiative, which need to be examined in greater detail. Uh, as of now, uh, we are not looking at um, any, any cooperation within the frame of, of, of that initiative. But our two scientific communities certainly do talk. I think there is a potential, considerable potential for building commercial relationships in the space field. Uh, but as I said, this is an area which needs much more elaboration than it has uh, had so far. Dr. Roman? I agree, Mr. Secretary, many of the things that you articulated in your, uh, your visionary speech. Uh, I remember um, a few weeks uh, before I left Delhi giving a speech to about 500 uh, civil servants uh, in the Indian government. And I asked the question, how many of you have associations with uh, China? And a few dozen hands went up. And I asked, how many people in the crowd have associations with Russia? and probably 40 or 50 hands went up. And I said, how many people in the audience have associations with America? And I would guess two or 300 hands went up. People associated through family and business and uh, educational uh, connections. Uh, the shared values between America and India are truly profound and lead to this growing strategic relationship between our two great countries and our, our democracies. There is a great deal of attention, however, these days on some problems on the economic side and ways that we can talk candidly, as you said, about fixing these. And moving through the multi-brand retail issue, hopefully resolving that in the next five or six months, 
that, that benefits both India and, um, and the United States, um, uh, but also uh, hopefully getting to a, a long-term solution on the civilian nuclear issue. Um, that could lead us, Mr. Secretary, to a BIT treaty and hopefully I would articulate uh, a need for a, uh, a trade treaty uh, between the United States and India at some point in the next three or four years, thinking bigger about trade between the two countries. Could you outline um, your thinking uh, about how we move forward through uh, multi-brand, building trust and candid appraisal about our, uh, our mutual interests economically and the infrastructure issues, and how we eventually could get to a bit and then a free trade agreement between the two countries? I'd, I'd love to hear your thinking on that, and thank you in advance. <coughs> thank you very much. Uh, you're absolutely right about the connections which you saw in that room of 500 students. Uh, it's often uh, <coughs> forgotten that uh, quite apart from the mutually shared uh, values, uh, you have s some, depending on whose estimates you agree with, something like between 50 to 150 million people who can speak and understand English in that country. And that's a huge number when you look at the globe as a whole. So I think uh, India will continue to remain part of the English-speaking world irrespective of what happens to its economy or anything else. So that is one connection that won't go away. And I think that is one of the, uh, the uh, you might say, spurs to this extraordinary expansion of the relationship at the educational level, the, the language connection. Of course, the values and are, are sustaining it. Coming to the, the economic uh, areas, you're quite right in pointing to the problem areas in this. On the multi-brand retail which you started with, I can only quote what the Commerce Minister, Mr. Anand Sharma, said when he said, he said it's a matter of time before we go back and try to fix it. And I can only do that because this is a political issue on which an official can only express an opinion. We can't give you uh, anything like a road map. <coughs> it's too fraught with danger. Uh, but he did say that, and I, I believe that that is the spirit in which the, the pause has been dealt with in the government of India, that it is a pause and that we intend to go ahead with it when the time is right. Uh, coming to the nuclear, all I, I would point to what I was talking about was, I think, a fairly productive dialogue which we have had with the companies and their phalanx of legal experts whom they're always surrounded by. Uh, and I think we did make some headway on getting to um, at least clarify uh, to the extent that they can start now quantifying what is their risk, you might say, in making an investment. At least that's the way I, I look at it. Perhaps it's only the first round. Maybe they may need uh, another round of discussions. But I think once we get there, then the debate will move away from, look, we're not satisfied with your law, to saying, look, we need a certain uh, set of uh, specific uh, you know, guarantees on what our financial commitment is. And then once you get there, you're on the road to progress. And as I said, an early works agreement has already started being talked about. Once you get onto that road and the companies do engage, I think they will find, as they have had experience in other fields, that India is a fairly secure market once you get these things fixed in the beginning. Uh, in fact, one of the companies did say that they have had problems with India in other areas of international law and governance and so on. Once that got fixed, they've done very well out of India. So I think once that starts, the nuclear industry could become one of the big tickets of the future. I, I, I genuinely believe that. But it's, it's going to be a long road, and, but we have started on it. That's, that's what I would say. As regards the BIT and moving on from it, that was entirely my, my view. I think we need to engage far more um, seriously on this. Uh, how do we take it forward? Because I think the possibilities on both sides are, are very immense. Uh, perhaps we needn't restrict it to just trade. What we are talking about is a comprehensive economic partnership of the type which we have got with Singapore. With, now we are working with Japan. Uh, we're working with the EU in, in a much broader framework. 
So, you know, there's, there's great possibilities of moving ahead in all those areas. That's the way I see it. And I think um, this will drive, the, merely the potential in this is going to keep us engaged and drive this relationship even when there is no big ticket item sitting in front of us. Foreign Secretary, I found it very interesting when you were sketching out your priorities for the year ahead that you started with the economic partnership and economic ties. And if I'm not mistaken, you mentioned to me that one of your first visits here in Washington was with the Secretary of Commerce. Is that correct? With Secretary Bryson. And. and Under Secretary. Uh, the Commerce Department clearly is key to building this economic relationship. And indeed, Secretary Bryson, and I wanted to mention this, uh, on his first trade mission abroad, he will be going to India, and the subject will be infrastructure. Uh, so I think that that shows priorities on both sides to uh, pursue this relationship maybe beyond BIT uh, for the future. I think it is possible to get there. And it's very clear that that economic relationship is going to provide important ballast in our overall relationship for the years ahead. So I was very pleased to see that that was high on your priority list for this, uh, for 2012. Other questions? Yes, sir. Uh, Bill Jones from Executive Intelligence Review. Mr. Secretary, uh, the Asia pivot, as you're probably aware of, has caused some consternation uh, in China. Uh, a lot of discussion, especially on the military side of it, uh, that, uh, that they are interpreting as being directed against them as a form of containment. Uh, especially the building of military alliances and strengthening of traditional alliances in the area. Now, India has had a, uh, a troubled history, which has gotten much better over the last 10 years uh, with China. Uh, and uh, obviously, uh, you probably view this in a little different uh, uh, setting than many of the people who are pushing it on this side see it. And I was wondering if you could be more specific on how you see the developing relationship with China in terms of, uh, of the so-called Asia pivot and India's role uh, in connection with that. Well, actually, the, the Asia pivot uh, has been focused uh, in its uh, articulation more on the Pacific Rim. Uh, certainly, it would extend to the Indo-Pacific, as it, it is called. But in their d dialogue with us, and we have had a fairly uh, important high-level dialogue with China, this has not been an issue uh, with, with, uh, between China and India. And um, certainly, I, I imagine you'd have to ask the Chinese what they think about uh, the, the pivot as a whole. But certainly, I think the Chinese have always uh, been uh, reassured by this very concept of India's belief in its strategic autonomy. And the fact that India has, through uh, its ups and downs relations with uh, various countries in the past, uh, not been absorbed into alliances which are aimed against any other country. So I think the, the Chinese know that. So I think to that extent, uh, they, they, they wouldn't have uh, a sense that the pivot is going to be something where India is going to be uh, aligned against them. The relationship between India and China is a very complicated one, very complex, as you said, better than 10 years ago. But there is uh, miles to go before we can actually be absolutely comfortable with each other. We still have issues to, to resolve. Our trading relationship has gone, grown by leaps and bounds, uh, and that is doing very well. But I think uh, the kind of sustained engagement which we intend to keep with China will focus both on our convergences as well as on our differences. And we would need to find ways of managing those differences with China. In the front here. Thank you very much. Um, uh, I'm a Japanese scholar working for uh, uh, Johns Hopkins University as a visiting scholar. Uh, my uh, my ma major is Indian study, and um, uh, my, my name is Takeuchi. Um, I'd like to ask you, uh, uh, you know, uh, currently, Japan has a negotiation with, uh, with India about the uh, uh, nuclear deal. Um, 
nuclear cooperation. And, um, Japan has uh, two hesitation. Um, one is uh, domestic reason. Um, it's just after the uh, Fukushima accident shock. And um, another hesitation that is a uh, uh, difference of uh, nuclear posture uh, with you. And so uh, I'd like to ask you, um, Japan's government required India to, 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 um, to show further, further stronger commitment for disagreement and nuclear proliferation. So what is your idea? Yes. I think we have been encouraged by the dialogue we've had with Japan, particularly in the last round or two. Uh, we are aware that in Japan there is a vigorous domestic uh, debate um, about uh, nuclear energy per se, which overshadows the kind of cooperation they can have with anybody outside, leave alone India. <coughs> but uh, in the last one or two rounds that we have had, we have seen a considerable narrowing of differences. And I think the Japanese uh, negotiators now do recognize that uh, India's record in terms of its restraints, its uh, export control regimes, and its uh, declared nuclear doctrines of, uh, you know, uh, um, you know, moratorium on testing and all these issues are reassuring. What they need to find is a, a way in which they can translate this into a balance within their own regulations so that the Japanese industry is also uh, able to participate in the growth of India's nuclear uh, estate, which it is very keen to do, and particularly since it sees great opportunities in, in this sector. Uh, I believe also that within Japan there has been, it's interesting, in the years since Fukushima, uh, something of a change in the, in the last few months on, on the issue of nuclear energy also. And I think this change will be reflected in the way they they take the, the discussions with India forward. So on the whole, we are optimistic. It's not uh, uh, quite a done deal yet, but I think we are optimistic. Um, <coughs> we are getting close to the time that we're going to have to call uh, this session to a halt, but there are so many questions here. We had talked about how to handle the questions, but could we do something here? A, a great benefit to our visitors is to hear what is on your minds. Your questions indicate what are the issues of most <coughs> importance to you? So I think that it would be instructive if I could take about four questions. Um, hopefully some will be those that others are waiting to ask. Ask for about four questions, and then we'll ask the Foreign Secretary to deal with those. But I'd like for him to get a sense for other things on your minds. So we'll take one here, and then one next there, on the second row, then on the, the, the lady with her hand up here, and then this maybe here, that you all got where I was pointing, sorry for pointing. <laughs> so let's take four questions, and then we'll try to do it that way. Mr. Secretary, I'm sorry. I'm Sally McNamara from Raytheon. Um, you've mentioned about energy and the other national assets that you're building in terms of uh, you know, coping with your international growth. One of the things you didn't mention is the most advanced national uh, airspace infrastructure that you're building. I wonder if you can talk about your overall ambitions for your national assets that you want to build and how, as a commercial company, we can help you in those endeavors. Thank you. Uh, Jonathan Broder from Congressional Quarterly. Um, there's a lot of concern on Capitol Hill over the role that India might play in Afghanistan after U.S. troops withdraw in 2014. I was wondering if you might address that. Uh, Mr. S uh, Mr. Secretary Wolf Gross, uh, now an independent consultant on the region. Uh, quick question: You mentioned Afghanistan, Pakistan, that direction, which is more look westward. Uh, direct your attention, if you would, sir, to Burma, which the U.S. government has all of a sudden discovered, and uh, perhaps expound a little bit on uh, Burma from a, an Indian viewpoint. Thank you. Or Myanmar. <laughs> <laughs> or Myanmar. Yeah, whichever you like. Indian point of view. And the last question here, young lady. 
Yes, um, thank you, sec Mr. Secretary. Um, you had mentioned um, India's increasing engagements with uh, East Asia, Southeast Asia, and the Pacific. I wanted to ask you what your thoughts are on a potential area of uh, the US and India to work together, which is on South Asian countries, such as Bangladesh, Sri Lanka, Maldives. Uh, is there any room there for the, the US and India to work together on these countries um, in this region? Um, has there been any discussion on that? Thank you. Oh, yes, I'm Nalanthi from CNA. And, and I will do a subset of the second question on Afghanistan about India's role in <laughs> Afghanistan after U.S. troops leave. I'd like to get yours just sense on the U.S. continuing role in Afghanistan. Uh, and are we handling our departure uh, in the best way? So I'll just add that into an Afghan bundle. So, Secretary. Yeah, I think. Uh, and this is off the record. <laughs> <laughs> Since it's off the record, I'll start with another joke. <laughs> That's about <laughs> the the two guys who are walking in the jungle, and uh, suddenly they see this tiger. I mean, tiger is an Indian thing, so isn't it? So, and they, one of them takes out his bag, and he takes out a pair of Nike running shoes. The other guy turns around to him and says, you really think you can outrun the tiger? He says, no, I only have to outrun you. <laughs> so, you know, this, uh, uh, you know, when you get to Afghanistan. Yeah, when you get to Afghanistan. <laughs> <laughs> I would like to assure you, nobody is trying to outrun anybody else. And certainly there isn't a tiger. There's no such, uh, uh, I mean, there are tigers out there. But uh, I think I'll start with Afghanistan, if I may, because uh, the current situation um, is that we have, uh, as I described, invested a huge amount in terms of uh, money, in capacity building, uh, in assistance to the Afghan government to build its ability, mostly in the civilian area, reconstruction, building its electricity lines, building its parliament house, giving it the capacity to have a state. In fact, we have assisting them even with their civil service. Uh, we are of the view that uh, the Afghan government does need assistance also with capacity building in its security forces so that it can manage its own security. We do a limited amount, but we would like to encourage the, the rest of the international community to continue its commitment, at least on that side, even beyond 2014, uh, to the extent it is possible. But even coming between now and 2014, uh, there is a strong possibility that this government, with its security forces, would be able to uh, continue to govern Afghanistan. Perhaps it may have to reach some kind of an accord with its, uh, its opponents and its enemies. But all this is only possible if there is some framework in which uh, there is no continuing flow of arms and, uh, across the border and these sanctuaries from where the Taliban are based are, are checked. So this is a, one of the uh, preconditions, I would say, for the success of the outcome of any kind of negotiation you hold in, in regard to Afghanistan. We have a relatively limited role in this, but I think we have made our contribution by way of uh, the, the, the reconstruction assistance and our assistance to the government of, uh, of Afghanistan. In the international context, I think by trying to create a regional framework in which you subsume some of these issues relating to the negotiations on a political framework within a larger economic framework. And that is why we thought this, whether it was called New Silk Road Initiative or whatever else you want to call it, this had potential. If you create a structure in which all the players, all the regional countries have a stake, then there's a possibility that from to reach that goal, you would make the kind of political adjustments you have to so that that kind of regional structure prevails. We have done a huge investment uh, start in the iron ore investments in uh, Afghanistan. These investments will really come to fruition, be successful, only if there is some kind of a regional economic framework which makes the evacuation of their products uh, viable. So I think these two, three steps together show the direction in which we are trying to move, and we are trying to move uh, the, the entire, uh, you might say, regional setup. 
we had a discussion on this both in Istanbul and in Bonn when the larger context of um, uh, negotiations on Afghanistan took place. And we believe there is a possibility that this could be one of the ways to, to reach a political goal through an economic uh, vision. Uh, that is one possibility. It is fraught, as I said, with the, the political difficulty which has to be addressed uh, by the coalition who are uh, in, in Afghanistan and who hold the maximum possibilities for talking to Afghanistan's uh, immediate neighbor, Pakistan, where much of the problem is, uh, emanates from. So I think that uh, would, um, uh, would explain. We certainly intend to continue to stay in Afghanistan well beyond 2014 in our current role, which is as a provider of assistance, as an important market for Afghanistan's goods. Uh, we hope that if the Afghanistan Trade and Transit Treaty with Pakistan <coughs> works, uh, at the moment, Afghans can sell to India through Pakistan, but vice versa, you can't do it. They can't buy from India. If that were to, to move on through, as I said, structures of regional economic cooperation, then we have a good chance. But we will remain committed uh, we will continue to provide them assistance. We will continue to train their people, including small numbers of their security forces. So that's on Afghanistan. As regards the uh, first question on aerospace, I didn't quite get it. But if the question was intended, what are the kind of assets we'd like to build? Uh, that was the question. On aerospace, yes, we'd certainly like to build uh, a, 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 an autonomous aerospace industry. Uh, just. This is one of the areas where I must say we haven't had the kind of um, outcomes which we had hoped for and for which we made fairly large investments more than, more than four decades ago. And this has come uh, into focus once again uh, in the context of two developments. One, we are trying to develop a small civilian uh, aircraft for passengers but it's still on the drawing board, and the, the likelihood of it coming into, uh, into even a prototype anytime soon uh, seems a little remote. Uh, and in the meanwhile, uh, today I was talking about the Dreamliner purchase uh, from the US, which is a matter which is being discussed again and again. And it's uh, from uh, an airline which is on the verge of uh, finding itself going into the red. So if we had our own aviation industry, we would have been in a much stronger position. It's also come up in the context of the latest uh, announced uh, outcome of the defense procurement process, which is on the me medium range, uh, MMRCA, where we had an ex-chief of the Air Force write an article say that if our own LCA project, the light combat aircraft project, which goes back to the 80s when it was conceived, had in fact been built, and we wouldn't have been in this competition now. But anyway, it's uh, never too late. So we are interested in building an aviation industry which would achieve the kind of successes we have had in two other high technology areas, namely space and civil nuclear energy, where we developed completely autonomously uh, capabilities which are of world class. So I think that is definitely one of the areas we would go. But in general, I think India would like to be a participant in the high technology industry across the board. Uh, that is uh, certainly part of our ambition. And being a country of continental size, uh, being 17% of the world's population, we think that's a justified ambition. Uh, Myanmar, Myanmar. Myanmar or Burma? Well, you know, there was a time we used to say, we used to be preached at quite often about why are you engaging with the generals in Myanmar. And I always used to turn around and say, you're constantly preaching us to us to ask us to engage with the generals on the other side of India. So what's wrong with the generals on this side? <laughs> <laughs> they, they don't even shoot at us, you know? So, <laughs> so but uh, we, we, remain, we remain engaged quite strongly with uh, Myanmar. We, I was part of the process of the policy review in the mid 90s when this began. And it began for two, two simple reasons. I think the, the terrible events of 1988 were so shocking that a, a reaction to it was justified. And being a near neighbor, an immediate neighbor, who had to take in a flood of refugees from the Chin state and from other areas of Burma, as it was then called, uh, we took a very strong line. 
But it was fairly soon proved that it was quite counterproductive. Because in the northeastern states of India, you know, the security in that area against insurgency can only be built if you have some kind of a working constructive relationship with the Myanmar government and particularly with the Myanmar security forces. The second, within three years, the Myanmar armed forces had grown from around 230,000 to close to 400,000, all equipped with Chinese weaponry. And suddenly you had conceded an entire space uh, which was part of your own country uh, 30 years ago and a very close neighbor and a very cordial neighbor to, uh, to China. So we decided that this needed to be balanced and we decided to, to seek a way out. And it was evident right from day one that there was nothing that Myanmar government wanted more than to balance their relationship with China. It was clear. And all they wanted was that somebody would come forward and talk rationally to them. So we did that. And we did it at a certain price. I know that we were accused. The, the, this was the phrase used in one of the financial newspapers of the West. It shall remain unnamed. Greed for Myanmar's resources is what is animating India. Mm -hmm. And you know, we lived through all this, and we have managed it. We kept our contacts even with the National League for Democracy. And I think we managed to be in a situation where we were able to talk candidly even to Than Shui and to tell him that in the long run, there was no other way out except to go for national reconciliation and an inclusive form of government. It's worked ultimately, not because we said so, but it's worked, it's started now. And I think we need to encourage this. And we are doing what we can, and that is why we are investing in the human resource development, in agriculture, uh, in uh, connectivity, whether by road or by rail. Myanmar has offered to us to be our link into Southeast Asia by road and rail. And we are going to try and do something about this. It's not easy. The geography is very challenging. A huge amount of resources will be needed. But we have a government which is willing to partner with us in this. It has said so openly. So I think this is a, a, an area we are en encouraged by the developments, the last latest developments, and uh, Aung San Suu Kyi's willingness to stand for the elections. Where that will lead, we don't know. But anyway, I think on the whole, it's a very encouraging development. And we would like this to be done in a quiet, constructive way without creating the sense that we are trying to take over somebody else's space. You know, we are not jumping in to replace someone. We are there to be a partner with the Myanmar authorities. Uh, incidentally, most uh, Burmese call their country Myanmar. Burma is the name given to the majority uh, community which uh, is in the middle of the country. And that is traditional. And there's one theory that it's the Brits who didn't know how to pronounce Myanmar called it Burma. <laughs> so maybe I, I don't know if that's true or not. But uh, so I think both names are acceptable even to Suchi today. Okay. South Asia, Bangladesh, Maldives, etc. Yes, there are a number of possibilities. Uh, the US is an observer in the SARC. And many of the SARC uh, activities uh, are areas in which we can certainly work together. The issues of energy the issues of connectivity, these are all areas in which investments from the outside world, including from the US, would be very welcome. Excellent way to, to close this. I do think that the, the collaboration that the United States has with India, talking about South Asia, including Nepal, uh, Bangladesh, Sri Lanka, and now we can talk about Myanmar and Burma. Uh, we did have different approaches. However we got there, we now, I think, through the acceleration of the di diplomatic track on the behalf of the U.S., I think there is great opportunity for cooperation now uh, in Myanmar. Um, I'd like to thank the Foreign Secretary. We have um, at the Wadwani Chair here at CSIS, our slogan is to help unlock the full potential of the U.S.-India relationship. I think we can take that slogan and marry it to your remarks laying out the agenda for all the things that we can be doing in the future. And I think we will have a great pathway ahead. So thank you so much for your remarks, for being here, and have a very successful trip here in Washington. Thank you very much.